Hello, friends, and welcome to Weekly Witness, Texas Impact's weekly podcast designed to help mainstream Texans of faith understand the legislative process and help you engage with public policy in the great state of Texas. My name is Scott Atnip, your host and Texas Impact's Director of Public Witness, and this is a vital week for Texas Impact policy priorities. The runoff elections are next Tuesday, May 28th, and interim hearings are underway to help shape public policy recommendations going into the next legislative session. What does it all mean? Here with us to discuss is friend of the program and Texas Impact's outside legislative counsel, Beeman Floyd. Spoiler, he's going to talk to us about the importance of these elections and how your vote is extra valuable. And he'll talk about ways you can get involved in public policy during the interim. And guess what? Texas Impact has tools for you. This is a perfect time to visit Texas Impact's election center and our Texas Faith Votes campaign resources. And since the general election season officially kicks off Wednesday, we hope you're working with your congregation to make a plan on how to educate and engage your community this election season. We also have teams and other opportunities to participate in uh, the interim legislative processes. So make sure you check out all the tools, resources, and teams at texasimpact.org. If you have questions about any of it, feel free to reach out at scott at texasimpact.org. So with all of that, I hope you enjoy this week's conversation with Beeman Floyd. Joining us for today's conversation is Texas Impact's outside legislative counsel and frequent guest on this program, our good friend Beeman Floyd. Beeman, thanks for being with us. Hi, Scott. Nice to be here. Uh, it's getting hot outside. That means it's summer. I know my kids have uh, have started the, the summer holiday. Uh, how are you feeling this time of year? Uh, well, feeling good. Um, although I think we're going to have a lot of work to do over the summer, uh, unlike other summers because of the legislative schedule. We are. And that's what we're talking about today. What a wonderful transition, Beeman. Uh, I know <laughs> folks are thinking about elections. The legislature seems like it's forever away. Uh, but interim charges uh, have been released. Uh, that work has started. Uh, talk to us about that process in general and why it's important. Uh, sure. Um, uh Texas famously has its legislative session every other year. Uh, We meet for 140 days in odd number of years starting in January. Uh, So we'll be having a legislative session uh, starting in January of 2025. Uh, A lot of times when I tell people that, they say, oh, so you get 19 months off and you only work for five months. That'd be nice, right? Yeah, it'd be cool, but that's really not what happens. Uh, Traditionally, what Texas does with those 19 months, with that interim, Um, is they rest a little bit and take a breath. uh, And then the presiding officers of the houses of the legislature, the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the house, publish what are called interim charges. Um, Interim charges are orders, essentially, that go to each of the standing committees of the legislature uh, that direct them to study certain issues in anticipation of the next legislative session. So it's Interim charges and the committee meetings that come of them are the basic building blocks for the policy discussions uh, leading up to bills uh, for the 2025 legislative session. And that work really does help shape what happens beginning next January, right? It does. uh, Traditionally and historically, it does. This particular interim, we have had some unusual challenges uh, that have in many ways curtailed the value uh, of the interim process, at least so far. We'll talk about maybe some of those challenges uh, later in the conversation. But uh, but to start, you know Texas Impact's legislative priorities. You're in the room when those get shaped, and you know better than most uh, what the legislature might be considering uh, next January when they gavel back in. So given all of that inside information that you have, uh, what should listeners who care about Texas Impact's legislative priorities be paying special attention to during this interim as we go throughout this this process? Uh, you know, they should be paying attention to substance. Um, there are really a couple of different things that happen in the current days of um, interim charges. Uh, one are One thing that we do is we look at the sort of big policy structures of the state and make sure they're performing properly. 
Uh, so uh, as a for instance, uh, we're taking a very big look at electricity um, uh, this interim. And electricity touches a lot of different things. It touches uh, climate policy. It touches uh, responsible environment. It touches um, uh, obviously social justice issues related to access to um, electricity um, in our state and social justice issues related to electricity rates. Um, and so uh, that's going to be a, a really big one. It also ta- it also has an impact on um, economic vitality. Uh, if we don't have if we have rolling blackouts and our electricity uh, grid is not working, that's going to have sort of far reaching impacts for the citizens of our state. And so you'll see a, a big push in both houses to bring the electricity generators in, to bring the transmission systems in, and to evaluate whether or not they're uh, doing their job properly. Um, so that's the kind of thing. And, and there are other examples. We're going to have a lot of hearings on water um, because water is going to be a similar issue. Uh, we're going to have um, a certain number of, of hearings about uh, education issues, both higher education and public education related to performance. We're going to have a policy discussion of whether or not the way we fund community colleges uh, is uh if we're doing that properly and if we're doing it in a way that really is effective for the communities uh, in Texas. And that comports with the longstanding Texas impact value of public education and equality in education. So uh, there are several strong policy uh, trajectories in this interim that that our people should definitely be taking a look at. As they're taking a look at those issues, uh, how does the public interact with what's happening uh, in the legislature, are there opportunities to engage? Is it something we're just paying attention to? No, you, how can we participate? No, you in bet. The that's what's nice about the. Uh, that's what's nice about the interim, the sort of classical uh, interim uh, process, is that when those charges go to the committees, then those committees have hearings, and those hearings are public hearings, very much like the hearings during the legislative session, right? But in some ways even better for public participation in that you don't have the avalanche of bills and the just grueling schedule week in, week out to get through 10,000 bills. You're really just looking at the issue itself. And so it's a great time for the public, uh, especially if you have a, a particular issue that you are profoundly interested in. It's a great time for you to talk to your legislator, to watch the hearing, and if you want to, to come to Austin and testify uh, in the hearing on how you and your community feel about that issue. Um, so they, so the legislative committees will have these hearings. And then at the end of that hearing process, they will write a report to their house of the legislature and file it with the speaker or the lieutenant governor. And that report, that, that interim committee, they, we call them interim committee reports, uh, they become the basis of legislation uh, for those policy issues that have been studied. So if you're studying electricity, you have the hearings, you find out we need to do something with the statute to make the system work better. The report is drafted and filed, and then all, that report becomes the basis of a set of legislation to be considered in 2025. So our hope is that over the course of the next few months, there are going to be some substantive conversations on important uh, policy priorities that will help uh shape good public policy in the next legislative session. Uh, something else that's going to help shape those conversations are the election results. You bet. And we've talked for years about the importance of primary elections. We talked about it leading up to the March primaries. We had a wrap-up episode after the March primaries. Uh, but next week, we have the runoff elections uh, that are going to decide some more races. Uh, so uh, talk to us about kind of the state of the Texas legislature, uh, the state of those primary runoffs. Uh, what's still at stake? Sure. Um, This is where the interim has been very unusual, Scott. Um, There was a longstanding practice in the Texas political space generally um, that said incumbents don't run against incumbents and people let the elections happen in the districts as they see fit. Um, I think lots of our people now know from direct experience um, that that the gloves are off uh, in terms of that longstanding uh, tradition, that there's full engagement. Uh, in uh, by incumbents and uh, statewide elected officials in incumbent races um, all over Texas. Uh, we all know uh, that that is uh, primarily because of public school vouchers. 
um, and secondarily because of the impeachment vote in the House of Representatives uh, of the Attorney General. Uh, but you have an, a, a full-on, full-on contest between um, uh, the Republican Party officials who are very upset about uh, the vote to impeach and are very upset that um, uh, public school vouchers did not pass versus incumbents who said they were voting the, their own consciences and the interests of their community. Um, the primary elections uh, flipped several seats. Um, as a result of this and left several folks, including the current Speaker of the House, uh, in runoff races. Uh, those runoffs are going to take place on May 28th, less than a week from uh, this recording. And um, they're critical. Uh, those, they are going to send both a message and create an actual legislative vote count uh, that is going to have a pretty big impact on those prime issues of uh facing education. But they're also, Scott, going to have a secondary um, impact in that a lot of the folks that have run against incumbents have never been in the legislature before. Most of them, in fact, have no legislative experience. So because of these fights over these very specific issues, uh, the Texas legislature is likely to have uh, far fewer man and woman years, days, hours, of legislative experience uh, than we had even in the last legislative session. And that's going to have an impact pretty much on every issue that that goes before the legislature. What's interesting about that answer, and I've been thinking a lot about this over the course of the last few weeks, because I'm I'm in one of those districts where there is a hotly contested uh, runoff. Right. And I think most Austin people, uh, most people who are connected with the legislature are seeing these races, at, like you said, as a result of uh, the public education, school voucher vote, as a result of uh, the impeachment vote. Uh, but none of that's coming up in my local community in the race. Uh, right. It all, uh, it seems to be focused on who will be best on the border. And so I wonder how much, uh, how much these election results are actually going to say that there's a mandate on issues like public education. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a really interesting puzzle in these uh, races because what has happened is that the contests are most definitely about public education uh, and the impeachment vote. Um, then a lot of money was put into those races, uh, mostly from outside of your district, right? So you're a great example, right. Scott. You're, you're living in Huntsville. Um, you've got, you live in one of these districts. There is a ton of money in that race uh, from people who don't live in Huntsville. So what do you do with that money? And the answer is you hire people who do campaign work. And what do the people who do campaign work do? Well, they, if your legislator voted his district on vouchers, presumably um, your incumbent made the right vote for his community. Right. So if somebody else comes in and says, that guy made the wrong vote on vouchers, unelect him, get rid of him, your community is going to say what? No, he made, not, he made the so vote much. we wanted him to make, right? Um, but – so your, your election pro comes in and he looks at the district and he says, well, we're not going to move the needle on vouchers. What we're going to do is claim that this guy is soft on the border. And we're going to take vouchers out of the argument because we can't win that. He already polled his district. He already made that, uh, you know, the other guy made that vote. Uh, we're going to say that the other guy made terrible votes on election security and is really um, not a good guy to be representing the interests of his community for that reason. This has gotten a lot of incumbents very angry because there was overwhelming support for most of the immigration restriction bills that passed in the last legislative session. And so right. I've heard any number of stories about great frustration that um, their, their records on immigration are being misconstrued or flat out lied about um, in the interest of drawing the subject matter away from public education and into a space where you might be able to shake the district more and so it's it is a in the context of electioneering it is a hard boiled dare I say vicious uh, set of campaigns that are going on out there in the field uh, that are that purport to be about all kinds of different things but are really about ESAs and really about the impeachment of the Attorney General because that's where the that money that's where the money came from. 
Yeah, and I think that money pouring in and and that attention being paid to these races, uh, you know, speaks to how important this uh, election is, uh, how important these runoffs are. And you know, we say it all the time: primary elections have low turnout, runoffs uh, oftentimes have even lower turnout than that. Uh, can you speak to? why it's especially important that folks in these districts participate um, uh, in these elections and uh, how you know their, their voice has even more of an impact now than it would in a typical uh, general election. Yeah, you said it. Um, the uh, the uh, senator in Texas represents about a million people. A state representative in Texas represents about um, a fifth of that, represents about 200,000 people, right? And so... Uh, so you say, okay, well, in that case, you need 100,000 votes to win. Nay, uh, because of these low turnouts in these partisan primaries and especially partisan runoffs, runoffs you're talking about, um, perhaps 2,000 people will vote in these spaces, right? Perhaps 10,000 people will vote in these spaces. The margin of uh, victory in these runoff campaigns is often in the uh, – very often in the triple digits of votes, in the hundreds of votes, and often in double digits of votes. 98 people, right? Yeah. Uh, we've seen this time and time again. And so, uh, so we know uh, that the, the, because of the way voters distill themselves by participation or not participating, uh, that each primary voter is just – powerful all out of proportion to the actual number of people being represented in Texas because participation is so very low. So if you, Texas Impact member, um, concerned citizen, community person, um, U.S. American uh, citizen, decide that you're going to vote in a primary election and particularly in a primary runoff, you are basically think of yourselves as, as 20 of you or 30 of you. Um, because your vote is is has an influence all out of proportion to the actual population of your district. Uh, one last question uh, on the runoffs before we uh, turn our eyes forward a little bit. You talked about uh, some of the uh, the factors at play as we move uh, through the interim and and towards the next legislative session. Uh, one of those runoff elections, as you mentioned, is is the speaker mm -hmm. uh, Speaker Phelan being in one of those runoffs. What does this race say? What does the fact that he's in a runoff? Uh, say about governing in the Texas legislature moving forward? Well, it says a couple of things. One is that um, uh, the speaker, like every other state representative, is a state representative um, and um, has to be square with his or her, well, his, so far in the history of Texas, community um, to, uh, to be speaker of the House because you have to be an elected representative first. Um, and it's complicated, right? Uh, if you become speaker, on the one hand, it is a, it's a wonderful privilege and a, a, a position of great power and responsibility. But on the other hand, it's a position of great complexity because you've got to simultaneously be a really strong statesman and be square with your constituents back home. And I don't say that as a oh, gee whiz, that's too bad. I mean, I think it's proper, right? It's why we, it's why the, the House of Representatives is the way it is. That community support that you need before you ever get to be the speaker's statesman should be and is very important, very valuable. And so I think that the I think the fact that the speaker is having an issue in his district is relevant, right? It says it says you have in your partisan primary with your party in your district that is the majority that party, um, your party is telling you that you are a controversial figure. Um, and uh, then we, the observers of that phenomenon, can say, well, is that an issue with the speaker? Is that an issue with the community? Is that an issue with the party um, that the speaker has chosen to join? Um, it becomes a pretty fascinating window into – the intersection of very local politics and partisan politics and then statewide uh, policy mechanisms here in Texas. And so, uh, as you know, Scott, I've said for many years to, uh, to all my clients, including Texas Impact, 
whoever the speaker is is extremely important to you and none of your business. You're right. <laughs> because I, they get I've elect- heard that before. <laughs> they get elected by the House of Representatives, right? Uh, but that's changed a lot uh, since I, I'm that's that's on my list of things to to self critique and decide whether or not I should ever say that anymore. Uh, because a lot of people have made it their business who is speaker. Um, there are a lot of people involved in that local election that have nothing to do with that community um, that are on the on the state and national level are interested in who is the speaker of the house in Texas. And so if those folks are coming in from wherever and participating in a very substantive way in a local election that happens to also have a determinative effect on who the speaker is, it may be a call for us all to get involved in that in that space. I don't know. I have I haven't figured it out yet. I'm still uh evolving uh in terms of in terms of that question, but I think it's definitely worth everybody paying very very close attention to who's working in that race, where the money's coming from and why so many people would be this interested in Beaumont, Texas. We have been talking for months and months and months if not years, I guess, uh, about the importance of this set of primary elections, about these runoffs. So my hope is that uh, folks who are in those districts really do uh, get engaged, make sure your friends are paying attention and turning out uh, leading up to next Tuesday. Uh, That said, next Wednesday, uh, I guess we officially begin general election season. uh, (laughs) And I think there are many people who are kind of dreading um, the months that will take place between Monday or next Wednesday and and Election Day. Uh, But this is really important. It's important that congregations, it's important that people are paying attention um, and getting involved. Uh, Any advice for listeners as we move into what I assume will be a contentious and consequential election season? Uh, Yeah, joyful engagement. Joyful engagement. Love it. Yeah, don't don't dread it. Um, The general election, you know, there's a there's a concept in Texas politics that all the races are decided in the in the primary elections. Uh, if you decide to fully adopt that um, as a, an absolute reality, then basically you're saying my life is controlled by redistricting and uh, otherwise I have no agency. I am the last person to say that it's not important. Um, I am the last person to say that there aren't just districts in the state that are drawn in such a way that it's very unlikely that there will be a contest in the general election. This is true. But it's not like a universal law. It's not the same as gravity or uh, my belief in God or something like that. It is, uh, it is, it is a political convention – a, a, a set of conventional thinking that are born of the science of political polling and partisan politics. Yeah, reject that. Go and really look at the contest. If you've got a contest in your area, engage in it and send a message. We, even if your guy loses, send a message that this is a dynamic space in Texas politics and not a ho-hum, we also have to do this before we get started kind of situation. Yeah, probably... I did, a, I did a poor job framing that question. I'll own that. But uh, one of the things I've noticed throughout this year is Texas Impact has had uh, many, many, many uh, events leading up to the primaries and afterwards. And in almost every one of those examples, we had more people show up than we anticipated. And mm. people seemed energized about civic engagement work. Yeah. And so I do think there's a joy in uh, bringing people together to do this work. And there's going to be a lot of attention paid on federal races, right? Um, the presidential race, uh, the Senate race here in Texas. Uh, But there are a lot of important races up and down the ballot from school board to city council to the state representatives race. And my hope is that we can find some folks that we really get excited about and believe in and organize some friends to do some work, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you, uh, I I got this wisdom from my wife. Uh, As many of you know, my wife was a school teacher for 26 years, taught uh, U.S. government for most of those 26 years. Um, And one of her um, assignments, her first assignment um, when the kids rolled into class is she did a thing called who represents me. And it was a, like a scavenger hunt almost of people, her kids had, they lived in a certain place and they said, okay, this is your address. You need to find every single office that you are allowed to vote for. And then the supply me with the name of who's in that office. Right. And 
the kids were flabbergasted that they would wind up coming back with 62 names. And it would be everything from the president of the United States of America to the people on your um, uh, community college board of trustees. Right. Right. And and the people who are on your water district. And, um, and so the kids would come back and they would be like, oh, my gosh, this is so fascinating. Well, voters get that all the time, right? You walk into the you walk into the ballot box and you start turning the wheel or scrolling down the ballot and you're like, I don't know who these people are. <laughs> right. right? Uh, know who those people are. Pretend you're in Miss Floyd's government class and right now go and find out who represents you and get yourself educated on every single seat that you get to vote for because today's tax assessor collector – uh, might be tomorrow's county commissioner who might be the day after tomorrow's state representative. That's where those people come from. And uh, you need to get out there and work on that stuff and know who those people are and make it make have a goal to be make an intelligent, informed vote on every single race on the ballot. And it'll it, it gets fun if you do that. It does. I bet the kids in Miss Floyd's government class would have loved Texas Impact's election center resources that allow you to go through and see all of the people on the ballot and uh, have all of the tools to research those. So um, there you go, friends. We You've will, got a tool that her students didn't have. I hope you'll take advantage of it. We will make it easy for you, time. but uh, <laughs> go get it. Yeah. All right, Beeman, uh, really appreciate the time today. Any uh, closing thoughts or shameless plugs you want to leave us with today? Uh, shameless plug is engagement, always. Um Join Texas Impact. Uh, don't be shy. Tell your friends. Um, this is really more and more about strong uh, showing of the grassroots of Texas and the communities of Texas. Uh, tell them the folks in Austin that we're here, we're listening, we're evaluating, we're critically reviewing what they're up to and holding people accountable, um, whether at the ballot box or on uh, any particular policy issue. So engage engage i love that beeman thanks so much for the time as always and we'll look forward to talking with you again soon you bet i hope you enjoyed this week's conversation with beeman and i hope you are inspired and motivated to get involved this is not just a fun weekly program but hopefully it's content that will challenge you to get involved and give you the resources to do so if you're in one of those areas with a runoff election I hope you're encouraging your friends and congregations to vote. These elections are critical. Remember, turnout will be low, so your vote and efforts count even more. Check out Texas Impact's Texas Faith Votes campaign for resources on ways to engage your community in this election and the general election in November. For those resources and so much more, check out texasimpact.org. While you're there, I hope you'll take a moment to sign up to be a member of Texas Impact. Your membership supports this podcast and all of the work to engage Texans of faith to advocate for a more just and equitable Texas. If you have questions about any of it, please reach out. You can reach me at scott at texasimpact.org. And with that, I think it's time to close out this episode. So remember, the world needs Texans of faith active and engaged. So let's get to work. Weekly Witness is hosted by Scott Atnett, engineered and produced by David Fasalo. Our executive producer is B. Moorhead. The opinions expressed on Weekly Witness are those of Texas Impact and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of our sponsors. Weekly Witness is a product of Texas Impact, people of faith working for justice. Visit us online at texasimpact.org.